continuing on through the book of Luke. We just started last week, and Luke really uh, has organized eyewitness accounts for us. He's done all the heavy lifting for us and has put this account of Jesus in a detailed, orderly fashion for the purpose that you and I will have ultimate and supreme confidence that Jesus is Lord, the long-awaited Messiah that was spoken of, that would come and be the Savior of the world. And uh, as we sit here tonight, we're the beneficiaries of that. And uh, we will always be the beneficiaries of that, eternally, eternal beneficiaries of Jesus Christ. And so for that, I am so thankful and grateful and what a great opportunity to just spend some time getting to know him and his word and getting to do that together um, with one another. And uh, what a blessing it is. So. The book of Luke, we're going to get through chapter 2. That's all we're going to do tonight. There's 50 verses, so we'll have plenty of uh, opportunity to take as much time as we want in the book of Luke. But uh, as you know, we've been trying to uh, work through the book of Luke pretty quickly. And uh, we're doing that tonight. A larger, um, larger section of scripture at a time and just sort of getting the feel of these different books and I, I hope that you're starting as we started Matthew and then went through that and went through Mark and now we're in Luke. I hope you're starting to kind of get the different feels of the different books. They, they have a different feeling to them. And there's a reason for that. It's purposeful. And we are uh, being able to see D Jesus presented to us from different angles. And that's important. There's no way that the books, all the books in the world can contain all the information and knowledge about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we have these Gospels that present Him in particular ways. And that's, that's one of the fun things for me is just as you, you start a new book and you're reading through it, it's like, oh, this, this feels different and I like it. And uh, you start to get to know Jesus in a, in a different way. It's just sort of like you get to know one another in different ways. It, you know, you, you, when you know somebody, you get to know them in different situations and to get to know them through different experiences and over different lengths of times. And you really get to know uh, people better that way. So that's what the Gospels do. So I, I hope and pray as we go through the Gospels and um, really look at Jesus Christ that... Um, we're understanding and knowing Him and falling in love with Him in a deeper and uh, more intimate way. So, Luke chapter 2, let's dive into it. It starts off saying, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee and out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So that little section there is packed with detail and packed with fulfilled prophecy and packed with information in order for us to know that Jesus Christ 
was fulfilling those long-awaited prophecies of the Old Testament that many in Jesus' day were waiting for and were thinking about because the scriptures had foretold this day that the Savior would come. In fact, in Jesus' day, there were many babies named Jesus because many women hoped that they would be the bearer of the Messiah. So as we look at these details and we get to understand that this is just Luke telling us that the Messiah was born and how he was born. But what's really amazing as we look at this is to see the detail of how God is sovereignly orchestrating his plan to come to pass. That's what's amazing. So during this time that uh, Jesus came on the scene, it was, it was a really dark time. And Luke, the historian, gives us all these time stamps, which are important. That's uh, a big thing about Luke is he's um, is, uh, William Ramsey, one of the greats, 1850-ish or a, a 19th century historian, said that Luke is, uh, is a historian of excellence, of, of such academic rigor, how he writes things. So he, it's very academic, but also very personal. As Luke writes, he also, as he gets the accounts from people, eyewitnesses, he also gets their feelings and emotions. We're going to see that as we go along here as well. But during this time, so it was the, uh, the time was pointed out that uh, Caesar Augustus was ruling. He was the Roman emperor. He was actually the great nephew of Julius Caesar, for you history buffs. And his original name, or his name is Octavius, but as he came into power, they called him Caesar, because that means ruler, and you might want to look at that as they looked at him as a supreme, absolute ruler. And Augustus actually means exalted or sacred. So they are attaching sort of deity to their emperors. And, and that developed as the Roman emperors developed more and more that they looked at their emperors and their rulers as gods. Also, the backdrop here was uh, the Grecians and the Grecian influence, the Greek gods. Uh, they're just a, a multitude of gods that they worship. But then they looked at the Caesars, these rulers of Rome, and they looked at them as these, these um, almost these godlike figures. And what was interesting about this time, it, before before Caesar Augustus came into power, the area in which is being spoken of here in the Mediterranean area and the, the area of the Middle East and, and Jerusalem and Judea and then more over by the, the coast of the Middle East of the Mediterranean Sea, it was a, a very, very violent time of power struggles. These power struggles were so intense. In, in fact, when Julius Caesar died, then there was three people that were now vying for power. The Roman Empire was divided into uh, three different uh, divisions, and these three Roman rulers would rule their areas, but they'd also be fighting with each other. And so um, Octavius or Caesar Augustus was one of them, and some of you may have heard of Mark Anthony as well. He was another one that was set to be in position for power. But um, as this Roman government was divided into these three different um, sections ruled by three different people, Mark Anthony and a guy named uh, Lepidius or Lepidus and Octavius, they would sort of vie for power until it was just Mark Anthony and Octavius Left And there was this a war where Mark Anthony recruited Egypt and Cleopatra and some of their forces to fight against Octavius. And Octavius eventually won and conquered Mark Anthony. And then he came to 
sole, supreme, sovereign, absolute power over the world. As he did that, he did some really amazing things. And Western culture as we know it is still experiencing the effects of the rule of Caesar Augustus. Really, Western culture has been derived from Caesar Augustus and his reign in Rome, which, by the way, he was 19 when he became the ruler of Rome, and then he ruled for 58 years. So he had a lot of time to do a lot of things. And one of the important things to note about his reign, Caesar Augustus' reign, is something called the Pax Romanus. Has anybody ever heard of that? So Pax means uh, peace, the peace of Rome. So what he was able to do, because previous to his reign, it was all about fighting for power. And it, there was war. It was a, a, a time of great war, a time of great darkness. And as he came into power, he used his supreme power to keep everybody in check. And he did that with a heavy hand, with an iron hand. And the, the saying that we have the rule of law came from him. Nobody is above the law. It came from him. So they set a law. And that law was supreme and it was ultimate and nobody was above it. And so what he was able to do through bloody force, through strength, through power, was to get the world to submit to the law to reign. So because of that, it was a time of, of peace, but it was a time of forced peace. It was a time of, if you don't do what we say, you're out of here, you're done. And it was just a, a really very violent uh, way that they would deal with anybody who would come against the rule of the law that they would set. So this Pax Romanus was a, a sort of pseudo world peace. And, and I say pseudo because if your heart is not wanting to be peaceful, but you're forced to be peaceful on the outside, but in your heart, you don't want to do that on the inside, then that's a fake peace. That's a false peace. It's kind of like that story of a little three-year-old girl that was on the, in the passenger seat of her dad's car as they were driving, and the dad kept saying, sit down, sit down, sit down, and and she wouldn't do it. And he said, if you don't sit down, you're going to get a spanking. And, and she finally sat down and she had a terrible look on her face. And he said, well, why, are you, why do you look so disgruntled and so upset? And she said, well, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the, outs on the inside, I'm not. <laughs> and that's, that's the kind of peace that the Roman Empire brought to the world. It was a, it was a fake peace. It was a heavy-handed peace. We might want to kind of looked at, look at that uh, in communist nations. So communist nations that um, they, they basically force people into submission. And if you don't, then you're just done away with violence. So that, that was the environment. So he brought in the, um, this uh, piece, the Pax Romanus, which uh, historians uh, call it, that type of piece. But another thing that happened during his reign was something called the lingua franca. And that means that he developed a common language throughout the whole world so that people could communicate, even if they're, they're, they speak different languages and they're from different areas. The um, lingua, lingua franca was a common language so people across the world can communicate very well with each other. And then the last thing was his building of roads. He was... Um, a builder of so many roads and so many well put together and well maintained roads that now transportation began to go out, go out all over the place. So that was the environment that Jesus was born in. I find it interesting that the Antichrist is going to do things like that. He's going to bring false peace. He's going to bring the world together. He's going to get people to, to, to feel like we got this now. And this Antichrist figure was, is going to be uh, worshipped as a god. And that's when Jesus is going to come back. So I, I find that fascinating that this was sort of a, a time that simulated the time where Jesus is going to come back his second time. But as, as he's ruling and as, as um, this, these important points are being, being brought out, we have to understand 
how sovereign God is. So we, people would look at, they would look at Caesar Augustus as this ultimate, supreme, almost godlike ruler. But he had an overruler. And Jesus was overruling him, but using him to fulfill God's purposes. And sometimes we freak out so much because we think, man, if, if the right person doesn't get in office or if this election doesn't go this way or this way, then we're doomed. But we, we, we're not factoring God in when we see that because Caesar Augustus, he brought all these things in, but for the Jews, this was terrible. He was occupying their land and he was squashing them. And he was in the place where, where they would call home, but he was making them obey, obey their rules and their, and their laws. And if anyone got out of line, he would just do away with them. But see, God was orchestrating all these events. He was, he was orchestrating Caesar Augustus to be in office so that when the Messiah came, before he was even born, that he was going to be born in a certain place because in the book of Micah, chapter 2, verse 5, it specifically says the Messiah has to be born in Bethlehem. A historical place, you could go there today, uh, a place that is um, a place that the Bible specifically said this is where the Messiah is going to be born. So it's details like this that for me over the years just give me confidence. I, I, in my mind, I can't see how the Bible can't be true. And this, that's just one thing. But so Caesar Augustus is in power and the, the, so the people are being squashed into forced peace. And many people can say, oh, this, this is miserable or this is terrible. But at the same time, God positioned him there. And he positioned him there and he put it in his mind, Caesar Augustus, he put it in his mind to have everybody register. So what that means is sort of like a census. So he wanted everybody to register or to list their property, list their name, list um, their family and all that so he can have records of that. So a Jewish person could even look at that as that's terrible. Now he's going to take everything I own. Um, he's going to tax me to death. He's going to go crazy. But God, is, God used that to get Joseph and Mary from their town of Nazareth to Bethlehem because Bethlehem was the specific place of ancestry where Joseph's family was from where they needed to go. So they needed to go. And, and how far was or is Bethlehem from Nazareth, it's about 90 miles. So considering how far they probably would have been able to walk, normally you'd be able to walk 20 miles a day in those days. And remember, the walking wasn't uh, like nice walking. It, it was like hard, rough, rugged terrain walking. And so with a far along pregnant woman doing this, it, it May, they may probably would have been able to go 10 miles. So it would have been a week and a half, two weeks of, of walking. They would have walked in a caravan. It would have been people from their town, many people from their town that would have walked with them. And so they make this journey together. Um, older people, younger people, kids, um, just a whole caravan of people. And so as they would go from Galilee the Galilee area, to Bethlehem. Notice it, it also says that, that they went up to Bethlehem, which might mess you up if you look on a map and you say, well, it looks like they're going down to Bethlehem from where they are in Nazareth. But actually what's happening is Bethlehem it has an elevation of about 2,500 feet and Nazareth has an elevation of about 1,800 feet. So that it's speaking of the elevation that they would have had to go up, uphill, to go not directionally go south. 
So as they're, as they're going, and these details pick up pretty quickly, but as they, they get to the, the city, and it says uh, another detail is that Joseph and Mary were betrothed, meaning they were legally married but have not physically come together in physical relationships in their marriage. And so Mary was carrying Jesus because Jesus was conceived in her by the Holy Spirit. She was a virgin, as an immaculate conception. God did that. And so as she's going and, and as they're traveling, and uh, their, their thoughts are, we're just going to get registered in the place uh, where the office is to get registered in Bethlehem. And so as, as they go there, then it just so happened that this was the time that she was going to have baby Jesus. But think about all the things that had to happen. Think about God's sovereignty. Think about how God orchestrates events. Think, think about how He puts thoughts in people's minds to get Jesus at a, the specific time, at a specific place, through the dictates of different people, even people hostile to the things of God. And He, he gets them there. And as she brings forth this uh, firstborn son, she wraps him in swaddling cloths and she lays him in a, in a manger. And that's interesting because the, the manger, so, so what would happen is as they traveled in this caravan and as Jesus got to Bethlehem, there is no place for him to stay, no place in the what? The inn for him to, to stay. Or for Mary and Joseph to say, no place in the inn. I don't know what you think about when you think about the inn that they were going to travel to, to stay in. But it's probably not correct if you follow much of the Christmas story, the way that's presented in our society, real neat and tidy, that the inn... The in, I -N, N, the word for that is uh, a word that would be used for a place where a caravan would stay, a place where a caravan would stay. So these caravans would come, and you can look it up, but it, it'd be sort of like a motel shape, not hotel, but motel. So there, there would be this uh, a courtyard and then rooms around the courtyard, circularly. And then there would be one entrance in. So you would go into this circular type of, you might want to think of a, a, a small arena. You'd go into this structure, and in the middle, that's where they'd keep all their animals, in the middle of that. So there'd be like a courtyard. And then around the courtyard, on the bottom floor, they would have stables and things like that for their horses and their cattle and the things that they would bring. And then on the top floor, they would have places to stay, but the places that, that they would stay would just be sort of a, a, a open, more like a cave, but they wouldn't have roofs. There wasn't a place in, those, in that place to stay. So that's when it refers to an inn. It was something like that, and they didn't have a place to stay in that. And that, that was a very rough environment, one, uh, for danger-wise, sort of like if you stayed in a real shady hotel, like some, I should say, motels. Some real shady motels is like, you know, you're driving through the country and there's no place to stay and there's one light on it says vacancy and you're like, I don't know if this is safe, honey. Um, should we stay? Maybe we should just sleep on our, our that kind of place. But the, so there, it was. These were kind of shady like that. But not only was it shady like that, it is extremely uncomfortable. Um, the the where they would stay would be just a, a very uncomfortable, smelly animals all around. And as they're doing that, there's they they would end up maybe because there is no room for them there. Maybe they ended up staying in the middle courtyard with all the animals. And when it says that uh, Jesus was um, laid on a manger, so I don't know what you think of a manger scene, but what it's referring to is this rock 
that would be rectangular, rectangular, maybe four feet high, maybe three feet high, and it'd be scooped out or dug out, dug out in the middle, and it'd be a trough where animals would eat their food. And that's where Jesus was laid. He was laid in a manger. The manger was that, that structure where Jesus was put in after he was born. So when you think about that, it just it blows me away that the creator of the world could not find a place to lay his head. And the Bible says he became poor so we can become rich. Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to this whole process, to this whole lowering, humility, humble. His parents were humble. He was humble. He was brought in, I would say, less than a humble way. In no way would any of these things give someone a clue that this, this baby is going to be somebody. This baby is going to do something. And, and this is all in the backdrop of Caesar Augustus being that guy who's thinking he's in control of everything. And in reality, he's being controlled by Jesus. That is just amazing to me. So as we move on from this, I just want us to really get in our hearts and grasp how much do we really think about and apply the sovereignty of God to our own life? If you want to have great peace in your life, tell yourself God's in control and really believe that. And don't look at the things that are seen. Look at the things that are unseen. Because God is behind the scene, directing and orchestrating and bringing, bringing about His sovereign will and ultimately it's going to be good and ultimately he is good so in verse 8 and I love this this chapter is so amazing because we get to look at uh, in particular for me three different views from three, three different very different people and their views of Jesus so watch this here's one group of people so it says now in verse 8, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. So shepherds were considered um, on the very lowest rung of society. They weren't look, looked upon highly. They were looked upon as people that were sort of not people who fit in with you know, sophisticated people. These are people, there's a reason they're way out in the fields with the sheep doing, you know, just taking care of them. This is, they don't probably mix well with people. They don't play well with others. They're socially inept in many cases. And they're just looked at uh, in society. They're looked at as the lowest of the low. So they're out there doing their thing. And I love this because First of all, I find it so important that no matter what God has called us to do, how big or how small, it's important that we're doing that. And many people I've seen over the years, they're waiting for something big to pop, which means they don't do anything. And they're waiting for that call from God to say, hey, you're the next thing in the Christian world as Paul the Apostle. And now's your time. Don't wait for that road to Damascus experience. Be faithful in doing whatever God's called you to do. Be faithful in that. And a lot of times when you're faithful in that, you find your satisfaction in that, your joy in that. And then when you're doing that, we see, we see this all throughout the gospel, then, then God intervenes. That's how he called the fishermen, right? They're just doing their thing, and then God showed up and called them. But these shepherds, you think about it, they, in their mind, and I love how the Bible presents this, that God shows up when people aren't expecting it. 
in many cases. And this is the case with these shepherds. So in verse 9, it says, Behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So you, ha you just have this one verse in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of darkness, in the middle of these people doing their job where nobody really cares, nobody really notices, in a time of the world where the world was just under such subjection and pain and heartache and sorrow, and then an angel shows up. And whenever you see in the Bible this uh, intersection of the supernatural or the spiritual with the natural, you have this response. The response is fear. You have this response of, of fear. They were, they were freaked out, as you can imagine. They, they see an angel. They've never, I don't think they've ever seen anything like this. Their reaction tells us that. And then you see the, the glory of God shining around them. And they were, the first thing was they were afraid. Imagine the complex angels get. Like every time they show up, people are afraid of them. Man, that's a tough pill to swallow that, that your presence makes everybody afraid. But this is a fear, a good fear. But notice also that the angels, when they are afraid, they say, don't be afraid. So when we in, encounter this, these supernatural things, our flesh will be afraid. But God will say, don't be afraid. And in particular, in this instance, in verse 10, it says, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings. That's the same uh, word that we get for the gospel. Good tidings. It's euangelion in the Greek, euangelion. And that's the same word. So this angel, he comes in, and so they're having this uh, heaven experience the glory of the Lord, which makes people afraid. And the angel said, don't be afraid. He says, the reason why. The reason why is because I'm a messenger and I'm bringing you good news. What I'm going to tell you is, is something that's, that you're going to like. It's going to be a blessing for you. He said, These, this good news or good tidings of their great, a great joy which will be to all people. And then he says, why? He says, this is why. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Now we know what a manger is. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Imagine this is, this is the message of the angel to this, these shepherds. And he's telling them, this is what this means. This is what this means that the angel would be saying to you. This is what it means to the world. This is what the world would have been looking for, especially the Jews. And it's here. It's here. Here he is. This is it. This is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the Savior of the world. And it's the glory of God. Notice that. It's the glory of God to do this work. It glorifies God to do this work. And He will bring peace. We know He's going to be, bring peace on the earth totally and completely when He comes in His second coming. And His desire at this point is goodwill towards men, meaning... I'm coming to mankind because I'm motivated by my love for mankind and my love 
that I'm motivated by is going to save all those who will put their faith in me. So in verse 15, it says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And I think that's amazing too. Because if the Lord has made known something to you and I, we don't always follow what the Lord says. We don't always move in the direction of obedience to the Lord. But let this be an encouragement. When the Lord reveals, when the Lord shows us something, then now it's our obligation to make haste and go towards it. So when you're reading your Bibles at home, or you're in a Bible study, or you're praying or worshiping, and the Lord shows you something, opens your, your eyes, your heart, and opens your mind, He's doing that so that you will follow through with that. So you will go in that direction. And that's one of the great things about the revelation of God when He shows us things. And our eyes pop open and we say, Wow, i never seen that before. That's one of the beautiful things about having a personal relationship with our Bibles each day. And there's sort of a romance to that, where we get into God's Word with the ex expectation that God is going to show me something and open my eyes and bring new light to a certain subject or a certain situation or a certain scripture. And that's how we should go into it. That's what is so exciting about being in God's Word regularly is because it's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword able to divide between the soul and the spirit, meaning able to get past all the fleshly stuff to the spiritual stuff, the supernatural stuff. And that's what's so uh, amazing, and that's something that I've learned over the years, and why I'm so excited about God's Word every day because He's speaking to me, He's opening my eyes, He's showing me things, and it's amazing. So, there, so now they're on the move. He showed us something, so let's go do something about it. So, verse 16 it says, They came with haste. I like that. Do you guys know what haste means? We don't say haste a lot, but they came fast. Put it simply, they came fast. They, went, they were into it. And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. In other words, they, they were testifying of what the angel said said and what they found and what was revealed. So they're testifying. Remember, Luke is writing this from eyewitness accounts. Luke went and interviewed eyewitnesses. That's how he got all this. Verse 18, it says, And all those who heard it, they marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. In other words, what the angels told them and what they saw was exactly the same. But see... That little interaction, I shouldn't say little, that big interaction that we just saw here, notice their attitude or the manifestation of their hearts that just beheld the truth of God. It was, they returned and they glorified and praised God for all the things that they heard 
in seeing. And I just think that's, that's what we should be doing constantly because we have His Word. And we should be praising God and glorifying God because as you live out the Word of God, it will bear witness to the fact that it is true. Does that make sense? That's important. I want to be extremely clear about that. If you and I will live out the Word of God, the Word of God will become more and more true to us. When we don't live out the Word of God, then we all have a tendency to be suspicious of it until we bump into reality and it hurts. And we find that God's reality is His truth and when we walk in His truth, then we open His Bible and we realize I'm living like it says in the Bible, and it's all squaring up. It makes sense, but assurance comes from living out the truth. Assurance comes from living out the truth. So that's crucial that we don't just take notes and leave them in our notebook or take mental notes. It's important that what we learn, we put feet on it. That we live those things out. And when we do, we're going to find that we're going to realize that we need God to help us do that. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us. And then all of a sudden, we're start to, starting to experience the power of God that's enabling us to do the will of God, which is revealed in the Word of God. That's a pretty good deal. Right? Yeah. This is what these shepherds experience. And the experience manifests itself in this extreme joy that made them want to praise and glorify God. Verse 21, And when eight days were completed, so Jesus was born and He's alive for eight days, for the circumcision of the child, His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So circumcision was uh, practiced by the Jews. And it was a way for them to understand and know that they were born in the flesh as sinners. They were born sinners. And the circumcision stressed the need to live by not the flesh, but by the Spirit. That our flesh must die and our spirit must live. But it's interesting, as this happens, one little note that the Jews would do this on day eight. And later on, it was discovered that day eight is when the coagulation of our blood is at its max. And that was the day that they were to be circumcised. So now in verse 22, it says, Now when the days of her purity, of uh, purification, this is speaking of Mary. And whenever a woman would give birth, a, a Jewish woman would give birth, she had to wait 40 days for her to be considered pure and to be able to go to worship. Now, what's interesting, if she had a girl, she had to wait 80 days. <laughs> so that's just, I'm just telling you the information there. So it took her 40 days. So the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed. And they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And so to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And so what they, they would do is they would bring their babies after the woman was considered pure or purified. They bring their babies to offer them to the Lord. 
and just as a way to say, Lord, this baby is, is yours, kind of like we do in a baby dedication here at church. We just say, it's, here's, this baby is yours. But they would do a sacrifice, typically an, an animal sacrifice. Typically, that would be a lamb and a bird. But if you couldn't afford it, you, would, you could do two birds. So this shows that they were very poor. They couldn't bring a lamb to sacrifice, which is interesting because their baby was the Lamb of God that would eventually take away the sins of the world, but they couldn't even afford their own lamb. So in verse 25, we get another character, and this, this guy, I love this guy, Simeon. This guy is so amazing. So watch this guy. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So right there we get all this huge description of this man that here we are 2,000 years later just reading about a, a man's simple faith. And this simple faith was described as just. So he, this deals with how he interacted with other people. So his interaction with other people, they would notice he was a fair, honest man. And then he, he was devout, meaning probably where him being just came from was he spent his life in devotion to God. So at some point in his life, which is exactly like us, at some point in our life, we, we have to intentionally decide that we're going to live for Jesus. A mistake a lot of us make or have made is we just kind of let life take us wherever and we float around. And as we float around and we don't, we're not definitive about what we're going to do in life and what we're going to live for. We're not definitive about it. What we do is we just bounce around and, and we look for things and we'll eventually exhaust those things, things to make us feel good about ourselves, things to motivate us, things to give us purpose and reason. And this man has pointed out that Jesus was his reason for existence. And I, I want to really make a point here that, that we all need to decide that if we haven't already. And that means that we say and get to the place where we realize if He's the Christ, then for me to live is Christ. And so, how do we do that? And how do we live like that? Well, we all do different things in life. But when we're devoted to Christ, everything we do is for the glory of Christ. It's for Him. One of the, th the saddest things in life is when God has blessed somebody with talents and gifts. And that person doesn't recognize where those talents and gifts have come from. And they don't use those talents and gifts to glorify the Lord, but they use them to glorify themselves. And that's why we see so many famous people that use their gifts and talents for their own glory. We see them ultimately end up in very bad places a lot of times. But when God gives us a gift, a talent, an ability, and we say, Lord, I'm going to use that for your glory, and God takes that and then He blesses that, and the world sees that and they will give glory to God, whether it's an athlete, an artist. I think of uh, some of the older classical painters and some of the uh, famous classical musicians and how many of their songs were so filled with their love of God, even, uh, even like Beethoven or Van Gogh and some of these uh, paintings, if you go back and look at some of these artists and how they used their arts and they saw their gifts and they used them for the Lord 
and their their work it just continues on and on and on because it's so amazing handles messiah things like that just brilliant amazing out of this world stuff and you think about that and and man i i want to see more of that in our day and age i want to see gifted artists use their gifts whatever it may be for the glory of the lord so whatever you do do it as unto the lord that's pretty much what it is so this uh, Simeon, it says in verse 26, he, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so, in verse 27, he came by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's mentioned three times in three verses. That's a, a characteristic trait noted about Simeon it was the Holy Spirit the power of the Holy Spirit working in his life working so that he would be devoted to God that he would be able to wait have any of you had to have had to wait for something like the Lord put something on your heart and you have to wait for it the Holy Spirit will let allow you to wait and if you trust God and His sovereignty, then you don't have to take matters into your own hands because you, you know God has a plan for you and will bring it to pass. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit to help you wait. Waiting's hard, isn't it? But see, Simeon was waiting and the Lord said, hey, you're going to see the Christ before you die. Imagine day in and day out. I didn't see Him today. <laughs> didn't see Him today. Didn't see Him today. Where is He? But it's the Holy Spirit that I would, I think, I don't know, but I think this guy had a positive attitude. I think he was a fun guy to be around. He was just and devout, and, devout, and I believe this, he, he probably, people enjoyed him. And he waited and he trusted, but see, he, he trusted and believed that God would bring it to pass in God's timing. So in verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. It's a good place to be. It's amazing how many things happen in church. It's amazing how many miracles, how many relationships, how many um, interactions with people. They, they just be about church. Be about serving God. And as you do that, God will do amazing things. So it says, When the parents brought the, in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. Now think about that. Jesus hasn't done anything for him. It was just Jesus. And there was something about when he, he saw Jesus, he knew that was it. This was the Holy Spirit too. So he knew it. He had been praying for it. He'd been serving. He'd been waiting for it. And when it happened, he knew. He's holding Jesus. And he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. Notice, what does it say next? That's important. According to your word. Do we get it? God works according to his word. So you want to know how he's working? Get into his word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And so this was, this was the blessing of Israel. This was the Abrahamic promise that all the nations will be blessed by the seed of Abraham. In other words, the Jews would be the people who are privileged, who are bringing about the Messiah in which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So verse 33, And Joseph and his mother 
marveled at those things which were spoken of him, of Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary's mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own, own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That's so heavy right there. But what it's saying is when you and I bring Jesus into a situation, you'll really find out what people are all about. Before you bring Christ in this situation, things may be going swimmingly. And then you bring Christ in and you really find out what's in the heart of a person. You know, when, when you can talk to somebody, you talk to them about the Lord and we like to call it launches in my family. It's like we're sitting around talking. You can always tell Somebody gets all fired up about, like, they're talking, and, and then all of a sudden, and we all go, like, they're launching. And then you know it's going to be a whole thing for a while. But sometimes you sit there, and it's just really boring, and nobody's really saying, and you're just, like, all superficial. And then, usually my wife's really good at this. She'll throw out something she knows somebody's going to launch off of, and then, and then it's all lively, and everybody's all fired up, and things like that. Forgot why I'm saying that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but in regards to what Jesus and Simeon and his uh, bringing Jesus and the blessing of Jesus to the knowledge of Mary, what he is telling Mary is like, look, having the Messiah is going to cause the hearts of people to be revealed. And it's going to be hard. She's going to have a broken heart. And many parents know about being broken hearted when their kids are not walking with the Lord. And that, and that for Mary to see her son being tortured and cut off and put in that position, her heart was broken. There many, and another example is parents who have kids that are walking with the Lord but they, they go through very difficult times. They go through hardships. They go through persecutions because God's growing them. And the tendency of the parent is to rescue them from anything uncomfortable or problematic. And that's hard for a parent to just to let God work those things out in a child's life and develop and build what the Bible calls hupomone, which is inner character, inner strength that allows a person to stay in a difficult situation and not keep bailing out. So that's what's going on here. So verse 36. Now we have another one of my favorites. There was one Anna. And she was a prophetess. And the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And Anna was of great age. She lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instance, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. Notice her serving was characterized by prayer and fasting. That was how she served. And she used her, her widowhood or singleness or time. I'm, I'm sure that was very difficult for her. She, look how she used that. She used that to pray and fast and then to speak about the coming of the Lord to anybody who is looking for it, or anybody who is interested. And that characterized her whole life. And to me, when we look at Simeon, when we look at the shepherds, when we look at Anna, I, I think, this, this is interesting that the people that are being told 
about this baby and the people that are being shown things. It's these humble, non-assuming, non-entitled, humble people that are serving the Lord and just, uh, in many cases, just quietly and with out attention and without the need for to be noticed and these are the people that God is, is showing up to and showing himself to so in verse 38 it says in coming in that instance she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him all spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem so when in verse 39 when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, meaning Joseph and Mary as they went to Jerusalem and had Jesus circumcised and brought him to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. Now they're finished with that. They returned to Galilee, their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon them. It's a great prayer for parents, grandparents, or if you're here, pray for those kids over there, that prayer. Verse 41. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, which was a, a tradition where all those surrounding Jerusalem uh, that were able to go, they would go, especially the able-bodied males, and then sometimes um, more, the family and, and such would go and they'd all go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. So in verse 42, when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, so they finished celebrating the Passover feast, now they're going back home. The boy Jesus lingering behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Why did they not know it? Because they traveled with a whole bunch of people. And so other people would be watching Jesus and other people, you know, these big groups. It's if you go to Israel and we go with the group, it's easy to get lost. You know, it's easy to, hey, where's, where's uh, Brian? What happened to Brian? Oh, I think he's stuck in the Sea of Galilee somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> we better fish him out. So supposing him, verse 44, supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among the relatives and acquaintances. And so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. So they got a ways out and they realized, where's Jesus? Oh, no. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? No, I haven't seen Jesus. Okay, we better go back then. So verse 46, it says, Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I, we sought you anxiously. We were worried about you, Jesus. What are you doing? And he said, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And notice when he said my father's business, he wasn't referring to Joseph because Joseph really wasn't his father, his heavenly father, God the Father was his father. But what Jesus is, is pointing out, and this had to be hard for his mother, because she understood, she was pondering all these things, and, and she had been told, you know, from the time she got pregnant by the angel who this was going to be, and, and she had all these experiences of she was going to carry the Messiah and then delivered the Messiah and she raised him for 12 years and we don't get any information about Jesus in those years. And then, it, and then we get this information and she, she was having a hard time understanding the purposes of God. She was having a hard time understanding that there's a, a, a bigger thing going on than her concern about Jesus' life in this world. And Jesus pointed that out to her and he said, look, 
this is different. Basically, he's telling, like, I'm coming here and I have to be obedient to my father. And he, he's sort of coaching her of saying, you know, you, you as a mom, you have to understand that I'm, I'm here and I'm called to fulfill a certain thing. And, and you have to come along and support that and understand what I'm doing. So that's hard for a parent to do. So in verse 50, it says, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. So they didn't get all that. So verse 51, then they went down with him and they came to Nazareth. So they're back home. And Jesus was subject to them, meaning he listened to his parents. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, meaning he, he grow, grew as a human being biologically and also in favor with God and men. And so a lot of details, a lot of information and a lot of different ways people were receiving the news about Jesus. And so as we, we just kind of put this all together and look at this, I think we have to make a decision. And this is what Luke is driving at through this whole book and through the book of Acts. It doesn't make sense if Jesus is the Christ, the creator of the world, if he's sovereignly orchestrating events, if he's given us talents, gifts, and abilities, it doesn't make sense to live our life independently from him. It only makes sense if we live our life in subjection to Him, in dependence to Him. And that is why we were created as human beings. And that is the only way we will find who God intended us fully to be, is to be fully committed to Him and let Him bring that about in our life. So let's pray. Father, we thank You for tonight. I thank You for my brothers and sisters that have come and are listening online. I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would impart these words powerfully to each soil that is here and that these seeds would bear fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you Sunday, Lord willing.